Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I'm Eki Tepsapornchai. Oh, brother, it's good to have you uh, back this week. Uh, last week, we inserted a special episode with uh, Tim Stevens. Uh, I got right. a chance to be with him for a week during the doctoral program, and uh, he's a dear brother. And so um, you you got a break for a week, and uh, that, that was good Well, stuff. and then the week so, before that, you were out here for Demon. So actually, it's been over two weeks. It's been three weeks since we last recorded together. Yeah, that's true. We did we because we did a couple episodes uh, in anticipation in of that. So yeah. yeah, well, we are back, and undoubtedly, this is a hot topic. Um, at least at this time, you know, in two years from now, when people are looking at this episode, they're gonna think, "What's the big deal?" Um, yeah. Maybe, but the topic's a big one, and so um, it revolves around something. Um, Alistair Begg a statement that he made on an interview, but really the topic is how should we as believers respond to invitations to things like um, homosexual so-called weddings? Um, yeah. And I think this is, uh, that needs to be the question because that question is not going to go away. Uh, Christians, you know, from now on yeah. onward are going to have to deal with that issue and they'll, and it will be genuine um, issues, right? Sure. Uh, family members who come and get invited to a wedding and they have to ask the question, well, it, you know, it's my son or my daughter. And though I disagree, you know, what do I do? Because it's not yeah. just some random stranger. And so right. there needs to be thoughtfulness. Um, we don't just cast family aside without thinking through um, how to apply scripture right, rightly, right? Um and so, Alistair Big, why don't you just share with us a little bit about uh, what the comments were? It was actually in a 30 minute interview, and I, I've seen yeah. some small clips around, but I think it's important the, the whole context. But um, just share a little bit about what we're talking about. What did Alistair say? Why is everyone all riled up at the moment over, over the commentary? Yeah, just as as a summary, and, and you can find the clip online if you look for it, but just as a summary, Alistair Begg was talking about a, a grandmother um, who whose grandson is living a homosexual lifestyle and was about to get, quote-unquote, married uh, with his partner. And the grandmother was torn over whether to be there uh, for her grandson out of love for him or whether to abstain. And Alistair Begg uh, essentially, well... Alistair Begg first uh, wanted to be sure that she has made it clear to him that this is sin and that she does not support this lifestyle, and that he she has also shared the gospel with him and helped him to understand that uh, only by repenting and turning to Christ will he have eternal life. And this grandmother indicated that, yes, she has made those things very, very clear. And then Alistair Begg essentially responded, then go ahead, attend the wedding, be a part of it, uh, and and she was surprised uh, because that's not typically the response that you would get from someone like an Alistair Begg. And he said, "Look, um, we get accused all the time of being very unloving people, and if you don't attend this wedding, you're just adding fuel to that fire. So you might as well just go. And while you're at it, why don't you just bring him a gift?" Um, so that that was uh, the the discussion that um, that sparked the fire on the internet. In terms of not only how do we respond to this, but also, you know, what do we make of of Alistair Begg? So that that's the situation. Yeah, and and I think there are a, f a few things that are important to uh, kind of preface this with, um, and it, and let's just talk about the interview. First of all, this wasn't a real recent. Well, it wasn't very recent. It was last year in September. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's been out there for some time. The interview was done actually being done concerning a book that. Alistair wrote called the Christian Manifesto, um, and that book covers uh, the Sermon on the Plain. So you think of uh, the Book of Luke, those first few verses there. Um, and, and so that was what the interview was actually about. And in the midst of the interview, 
you know, the, I, I don't know who the interviewer was. I, I imagine it's someone associated because I think it's their podcast or whatever. Um, it, they, they were talking about how to love your enemy, right? According to those passages, what does it look like to love your enemy as Christ loved his enemies? Um, and, it, and, you know, Alistair is not a mushy gushy kind of guy. I've only heard a handful no. of things from him. But he's he's not, you know, he's not a Russell Moore. He's not a, you know, these no, guys no. who are, well, I use Russell Moore. I would just call him a traitor to the faith. But anyway, um, he, he's not one of these guys, right? I mean, he's very solid. Um, at, at least that's his reputation. He has the reputation of being a faithful um, man of God. He is an excellent expositor. I, I don't think anyone yes. could um could could say otherwise who knows anything about him and so he's focusing on this teaching in luke chapter six um and it's interesting because just before he makes that comment he says this and i want to quote he says he's talking about forgiveness and forgiving people who wrong you and things like that he says to forgive a person does not mean that we condone what they've done or that we're just simply saying it doesn't matter no we don't condone it and it does matter if it wasn't wrong, there would be no need for forgiveness. He said that statement just before he gave this honestly terrible advice. And so um, just the little snippets that I've seen on the internet, and I, I've been busy, so I haven't gotten a chance to read through a whole bunch of them, but most of what I've read have been attacks, accusations, um, Clearly, after I watched the whole interview this morning before getting ready for the podcast, um, a lot of those con- comments were coming from people who didn't watch more than just a small clip. So even in that interview, he's saying there are clear distinctions between what's right and wrong, um, yeah. and but we have to forgive people, and in forgiving them, it doesn't mean that we condone their sinful actions. So obviously, Alistair Begg is not here saying that there's no sinfulness involved in what the grandson's doing. And I think he makes right. that point, right? Yep. Um, yes. When he's when he's talking about asking or answering rather questions about the grandmother's uh, relationship and response. And he makes statements like, you know, does he know that um, you can't condone his actions at all whatsoever? Um, you know, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but he makes these statements, but somehow I don't see any of them coming up in the comments. And so right. he's not at all capitulating on the fact that homosexuality is sinful. And I exactly. think that's right. We cannot miss that fact, right? right? That has to be included in our assessment of then his application in that situation, right? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. And let me just add this about Alistair Begg. Um, I have followed him a little bit more, I, not on a regular basis, but if, and I've told people this, if there was only one pastor in the world that I would listen to, I'm partial to John MacArthur. I was saved at that church. I was raised under his teaching, but if not John MacArthur, Alistair Begg would probably be second. That, that's how highly I regard him. His ministry has gone for a long time. He is not mushy. He is not soft. And you are absolutely right. He has not capitulated He has not capitulated on the fact that homosexuality is a sin. In fact, there were many members of his church that pointed out that he recently gave a message going through Romans 1, and he was crystal clear on his position there. So this is not... This is not like J.D. Greer saying that God whispers, uh, you know, that we ought to whisper what God whispers about and shout what God shouts about in talking about homosexuality. And in in the process of doing that, J.D. Greer essentially, um, he, he kind of flattened uh, the seriousness of homosexual sin. Um, Alistair Begg did not do that. He's always been very clear about this and very recently going through Romans. So uh, some people are saying that now he's affirming LGBTQ, he's going to be marrying couples pretty soon. Okay, let me just say this. You guys need to do better research than this. And if we're going to criticize each other, and look, the public critique, I'm not against that. We ought to be able to publicly criticize what is being said in public, and we ought to critique from a doctrinal standpoint where we think someone is wrong. I am 100% in favor of that. What I am not in favor of is is portraying someone as being something that they're not, portraying someone as supporting or teaching something that they're not. Now, the application part, and I'm sure we'll get to that in just a moment, the application part I completely disagree with, but to say that he is off doctrinally— 
is especially on the topic, uh, on the subject of LGBTQ and whether such lifestyle and, and such unions are sinful or not, he is crystal clear on. So let's be very clear on that. We stand on the same side there. The issue here is not primarily doctrinal. It is primarily applicational. Yeah, and that's a good point. And I and I think I, I'd like to take it even further. If you're making accusations that aren't true um, and insinuating yep. that he's going to be doing, you know, homosexual weddings and things in the future, you yeah, are actually in the place of sin. Yeah. I, I mean, you are actually not only just I, I mean, you're taking the the place of the accuser and you're in the wrong. Yeah. Um, and it's ungodly, and it would be just as fitting for someone to say to those people as it was for Jesus to Peter in that moment, get behind me, Satan. And, and yeah. so I think we had to take those things very seriously. I, I intentionally didn't do a whole lot of research just on Alistair for this podcast other than to make sure I knew what he said. Um, and then and then to see if he said other things about homosexuality. Of course, there's been clips over the years that I've caught yeah. that get shared around. But I, I'm, I'm hoping what I can bring to the table is, um, you know, a little bit more about him. So we have that angle and maybe the angle of how should what kind of questions should we be asking of someone who seems to be faithful, but we just don't know a lot about. Um, yeah. Well, one is go watch the entirety of whatever that clip came from, because, it, you know, the context matters. And in this case, in this instance, you find how he's making clear statements about how we can we we forgive people, but that doesn't mean we condone their sinfulness. And so you don't see any capitulation there, even in the exact same uh, interview where he says this. Now, you, you talk about some of these guys who have made some of these comments. Um, I, I, I want to read. It's kind of lengthy, but it's about a paragraph, but I want to read this. Um, I did find an article this morning. I was just trying to figure out uh, where he Alistair said this so that I could yeah. listen to the actual teaching or interview or whatever it was. And I found an article. I don't know who wrote the article. I intentionally didn't look at the bottom to see, but he quoted someone um, who shared something online about Alistair and he didn't attribute it. He just said basically someone said, so I don't know who said this. Um, yeah. Don't really care, but I just want to give an example and we'll kind of talk to it. Uh, so here's the quote. Um, so the guy uh, hears what Alistair says, and he writes this publicly. He says, you have geldings like Beg, who can spend decades in quiet, nice, respectable ministry, but inwardly be total cowards, worthy of nothing but disgust. There is a desperation for men who act like men to lead. Conservative evangelicalism is desperate for men to lead, but the pathway for men as men to climb their way to leadership are completely cut off to them from the start. The only way forward will be to have churches which incentivize masculine leadership from the get-go and that attract <laughs> and train young men who are really men oh. and not conflict-avoidant nerds. And the second you do this, respectable men like Kevin DeYoung will attack you for your mood. You have been willing to step, you have to be willing to step over these people. You have to be willing to let the dead bury the dead. Respectable, winsome, Alistair Begg evangelicalism wow. is dead and soon to be buried. Wow. That's that's ridiculous. That That is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, when you look at the sheer number of years of faithful service and preaching— and when you hear Alistair's preaching, he has been an uncompromising man of truth. This is not someone to be mistaken for, as you mentioned, people like Russell Moore or Ed Stetzer or you know um, David French. Uh, he, he's not in that camp at all. He, he's on our side, and he has faithfully proclaimed the gospel, which provides real life. And, and I can add this, too, and it's something to consider. Um, I have heard from a number of people— um, Close, closer to the scene at Alistair's church, and one person in particular who's very close to everything that's going on. And I will say this, there were many people in Alistair's church that when they heard that were shocked. They were surprised. They were not expecting that. And if you were to search what everyone else has said from that staff, I don't think you'll find anyone else who has parroted or repeated or shown their support um, for that council. Now, why do I point this out? For this reason, 
Alistair's teaching has been clear enough that even the people in his own church don't agree with that application. All right. So, I mean, if, if Alistair were um, a spineless person giving into the world, giving into woke culture, giving into feminism, giving into LGBTQ and, and this whole God is love and being inclusive and all that, then no one at that church would have been surprised. Everyone would have celebrated it. Um, but instead, what I have heard consistently from people is that people were surprised, but they have overwhelmingly testified to the fact that his ministry overall has been rock solid. And like I said, he went through Romans 1, and he held very strongly to what it taught. Now, a lot of these people that are pushing this whole, well, men need to be men, I'm the first to say that, because that's 1 Corinthians 16, says, act like men, be strong, all right? Let all that you do be done in love. So that's very important that we act like men. But I think we've reached a point where people are making this into, this is all godliness is about, is just acting like men. And and their version of acting like men have less to do with their faithfulness to what the Scripture teaches, and more about how they respond to various issues on various fronts. And we, we need to really step back and take a look at that and ask ourselves, what is it that Jesus Christ wants us to do? Um, how are we called to be faithful? And when I look at, at a man like Alistair Begg, he far outpaces the vast majority of these critics who are slinging arrows at him and calling him uh, spineless yeah. or a coward or anything like that. In fact, Alistair had to, he really had to um, explain himself to a lot of people that disagreed with him. So in a sense, and again, I don't agree at all with the counsel that he gave, yeah. but he actually had to be able to explain that and stand upon that um, with people around him who disagreed with it. So I, yeah. I, that's not the definition of a coward, even if he's standing upon what I believe is the wrong application. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, this kind, and I only read, I, and I only read that because this seems to be becoming more and more of the type of response we see to perceived wrongs. Um, and I say perceived wrongs because sometimes we we don't understand the full picture and it does change the yeah. outcome. And I agree with you. I, I think I think Alistair Biggs application here was absolutely wrong. Uh, I, I'm in total disagreement uh, in in every way. But um you know, whoever made this statement, you, you need to sit down and find a healthy, solid church and sit under faithful men. You're not ready to be teaching. I hope you're not in leadership. Right. Um, you, you are an immature young man, young man, um, full of worldliness. Uh, and that's what yep. this is. This is so chock full of worldliness um, that it's just only by grace I'm I'm with holding saying that this sounds like someone who's not even Christian. Um, and, and so, and I, I don't know the nature of social media and we can all get caught up in, you yeah, know, hot right. takes that we shouldn't do, but, but this kind of response is not the godly response. So you want to talk about being a godly biblical man, um, or a godly biblical woman. How, how do we respond? How do we process statements like this from someone who is known to be faithful. Well, I, I think, you know, I, one, I just posted a video actually of Alistair Begg that I found on him talking about how he would disobey the law, um, over conversion therapy. So, you know, yeah. go to my Twitter and watch that like two minute clip. Um, and, and I posted that to show that, wait a minute, um, I, either he has some kind of total personality disorder, um, or there's more to his, reasoning and view than what we think and, and that's yeah. the point because he's so solidly against homosexuality um you know and all these things that he's willing to go to jail over it and you mentioned right. his uh teaching through romans well you know so on saturday morning uh we have a men's breakfast and right now we're going through first timothy and last week um providentially we're in five well just listen to five one i, I mean here's the response i i guess the attitude that we ought to take anytime someone like Alistair um, makes a mistake or says something like this. Um, chapter 5, 1, Paul says to Timothy, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather plead with him as a father to the younger men as brothers, to the older women, uh, women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. 
that's the attitude. Uh, that's in stark contradiction to the paragraph I've just read a few minutes ago. Yeah. Um, right. It doesn't say not to rebuke them. It says do not sharply rebuke an older man. Yeah. And 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 the, the the point here is that there ought to be some level of respect um right and and so yeah you can question alistair and as you brought up i mean many people have but i think it you know it's not like we're talking about russell moore again um i know he's right. an easy target but just for reference um it, it's not like we're talking about you, you know joel osteen a false teacher we're talking about a man who has been in ministry longer than some of us have been alive um he's been faithful known to be faithful during that time period. Um, and then all of the sudden he makes not a theological mis misstatement in, in right. one sense, it, it's an, it's a theological application, right? Right. right. That's the right. problem. Um, right. and, and so I think we have to approach it with, you know, okay, is this coming from a godly man or is this coming from a false teacher? Is this coming from someone who has you know teeter tottered his whole ministry back and forth between right. what's right and wrong, or is this someone who has been uh, has a reputation of being solid, right? Right. Um, In other it, words, what what's the fruit of his ministry, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we approach it based on that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the that that's what we have to keep in mind. Now, that being said. We do want to watch out to see if there's going to be a chain of bad counsel that he starts to give. And, yeah. you know, if if we start to see that pop up or if we start to see him um, compromising on what the Bible actually says, well, he's going to, in essence, contradict what he has taught in the past. And that's going to be at that point, then I would start to um, start to embrace the this idea that, hey, we need to just avoid him altogether. Right, but um, again, we need to we need to be able to distinguish someone's view from how they're applying it. Now, I know that there are scriptures in the Bible that many would apply to this situation. Right? What, for instance, um, what partnership does light have with dark? Um, we need not, we should not even be participating or or giving approval to anything that is sinful. You know, those verses are there in the Bible, and yeah. certainly in this situation. I think that is a right application uh, for why we should not um, be attending this. Now, obviously, Alistair Begg, he's been preaching long enough. He knows the Bible well enough that he knows those verses. And so in some way, shape, or form, and in this one specific situation, and, and by the way, while this does not change my sharp disagreement with his this situation, um, I do understand that this was very specific to this woman's uh, situation. That um, there were perhaps other family members who are believers that were not attending for the reasons that uh, most of us would not attend, and he totally agreed with them not attending, and he his rationale was really specific to this one woman. Now, the problem is the rationale that he gives in explaining it sounds like it applies to everyone and everything. That being said, even though we would all agree on those verses that you can't participate in or give approval of sin— um, in some way, he's reasoning through this that this woman is not doing either by being there with her son. Now, again, do I agree with that? No. Um, but again, it's not it's not a doctrinal disagreement. It's an application disagreement. We have to we have to be able to think through this more carefully because situations are not always as black and white as we would like them to be. In this case, this does seem like a black and white issue. But a man of God like him, who's been faithful for so long. And he knows this woman better than I do. He knows the background. He knows all that's going on. I still cannot imagine a situation where I'd give that kind of counsel, but we also have to respect that he's the pastor for that lady, not me, not you, not anyone else. Yeah. And and I think, you know, we spent quite a bit of time just kind of talking about how to approach, you know, something like someone like Alistair. And I think that's I think that's important for guys who are listening. Well, like, we'll get on to whether or not we should go to a wedding. Um, well, this is important because I, I think in our culture, we've forgotten that faithful men are still fallen men. Yeah. Um, yeah. We almost, I, I mean, if you were to believe social media, it, just pick your platform, doesn't really matter. You, you would come to the conclusion that if someone is not absolutely perfect, not in all 
not just in all their doctrine, but in all their application, then they should be shunned and hated and called, you know, um, sissies and weak men and cowards, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but that that's just not true. I, I mean, we need to be reminded that every, every, a uh, faithful god-fearing man is going to make mistakes and if you're in yeah. public ministry you will make public mistakes it's not possible on this side of glory for that to be any other way now which mistakes you make matters you know how you make them matters in terms of you know ministry and continuing on and things like that um and so we're not excusing uh the the, the wrongs but we're just saying you do have to process these things rightly, and there'll be more of this as as you know as the society continues on this downward spiral, and um, life gets more complicated. Um, I mean, just think of all the questions about AI that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Yeah. Things that we haven't thought about in ways we aren't even thinking about right now. Look, they're going to be faithful men who get some applications wrong. I'm sure. And we need to approach it biblically and, and not as though we don't have any of those faults in our own life. I'm not saying our faults excuse theirs, um, but but we certainly can't approach these things arrogantly, right? I mean, right. John MacArthur's not perfect. Vody Bauckham's not perfect. Paul Washer's not perfect. Pick your hero. Um, and yeah, only a fool perfect. would say yeah. their hero has never made a mistake. Um, it, it, you know, and so... Yeah, and so that, that's why I think we spend so much time on that. But let's so let's talk about and just address the wedding thing. We both absolutely disagree w- with Beg's conclusion and his application. Um, and we're going to deal with this again, right? I, I mean, this is going to be in our yeah. own churches. Um, it's going to become more and more prominent, I think. Um, it, so let's just talk about weddings. Let's talk about proms. Let's talk about I- any kind of um, ceremony that would uphold or celebrate any kind of union that would be homosexual. So whether it's a so-called marriage or a dating relationship or, you know, whatever we can think of just categorically, those kinds of things, um, the wedding issue is getting a lot of attention, but yeah. So can we say biblically that the situation generally speaking, wouldn't matter that a believer should not go to uh, a, a a homosexual ceremony. I'm not going to call it yeah. a wedding. I'm just call it a ceremony because that's what it is. Yeah. A homosexual ceremony um, should a, should a believer refrain from that in 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 every scenario, generally speaking, and why? It's an abomination to God. Uh, when we think about, well, in this case specifically, where you know that the wedding, obviously, marriage is between a man and a woman that was instituted by God, going back to Genesis two, um, but. Uh, Revelation chapter one ends with the fact that people have not only turned away from God, but they're actually encouraging others to the same kind of sin that results in God handing them over um, to to greater darkness and, and depravity. Uh, so we we can't support that. Uh, we compromise our own witness. We and and it's not that in, in some cases it might not even be that we look like we're approving of it, but I think it shows that at least in our appearance of being there, that that sin is not as serious as it really is. Okay, homosexuality, and this comes up quite often. People ask me, well, you guys talk about homosexuality, but you don't talk about the other sins like slander and adultery and things like that. You guys just focus on homosexuality. Well, that's not true. I I preach through the Bible verse by verse, and we are to stand against all sins. What makes homosexuality unique, though? One, it is a major cultural issue and and just the fact that it's a cultural issue by itself is not it's not the point but it's that it's a cultural issue that has infiltrated the church and it is affecting a lot of families um, it is affecting a lot of parents especially in terms of how to deal with this kind of situation and there have been many churches that have capitulated capitulated on this and have uh, allowed homosexuals become me- members even uh, make them a part of uh, clergy, make them into ministers, even pastors, even to to that to that level, and so this is a very serious issue. We must draw a hard line that that this will not be tolerated. And when you look at Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one makes it very clear 
that part of the judgment of God against a culture that continues to suppress the truth and unrighteousness is that he hands them over to a debased mind, and in handing them over, they actually perform these deeds. They start to pursue um, what is unnatural. They start to forsake the natural, uh, the natural function of a man and, and a woman, and, and they start to pursue same-sex relationships. So what you see in Romans 1 is actually proof that when you see homosexuality on the rise, it's actually proof of God's judgment against that nation. It is a level of sexual deviancy that also leads to greater crimes. If, if you talk to any police officer, talk to any detective, some of the most violent crimes happen within the homosexual community. And when we talk about pedophilia, pedophilia comes largely out of especially the transgender, the quote-unquote transgender yeah. community. So there, there's a lot of darkness that comes out of this that cannot be ignored. And so we have to recognize this, recognize that this is part of God's judgment of society in decay. And we as children of light need to be shining light, not standing idly, certainly not approving of the darkness, but not even standing idly by and, and ignoring the darkness like it's not even there. We're supposed to shine the light upon it. And so any kind of celebration of this type of abomination, um, it's just... It's just off. It's off the table. It's off the table. Now, I think this is going to be the struggle that most of us have. And I'm thinking of First Corinthians. Um, I think it's chapter six when Paul says, "Look, I, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who's a liar, a homosexual, this, that, and the other." And he lists a whole bunch of things. And he said, "And when I wrote that to you, I meant do not associate with such people mm -hmm. who call themselves followers of Christ." I'm not yeah. talking about the world, because if I was talking about the world, you'd have to be completely out of the world. So we do understand that part of our testimony is that we are in the world. We're not supposed to separate from sinners. If we separate from sinners, for, and when I say sinners, I'm talking about those who have, put not, who have not put their faith into Christ. If we completely separate ourselves from unbelievers, how are we going to evangelize? How are we going to, um, to develop that relationship that we can show them that we love them and want to share the truth with them? So there's a tension there that we... We can't just forsake anyone who has rejected Christ, but that's not the same thing as actually showing approval for or tolerating what God says is an abomination. And in this case, it's the sexual immorality of homosexuality and, and all that extends beyond that. Yeah, I, I mean, that's really good. And and I think the consideration is um, has to be, is what we're doing— um, seen as a participation you know can we yeah. be there without it being a form of participation and you know various ceremonies um that that may not always be the case depending on you know the scenario i mean these are things you have to think through um it, it, but a wedding it, you know I, and a wedding is one of those things where you the audience is actually solicited for participation in the vows right yeah. Um, right. I mean, you hear it, you, you know, does anyone have any reason why this, you know, union shouldn't take place or whatever form that comes in? Well, I mean, and, and this was in the article by who, whoever, whoever that wrote that article that I read this morning brought that up. And I thought, man, that's a really good point. Um, you know, and so you, you can't be there without it being seen as support. I, I mean, that's the whole nature of yeah. the wedding uh, of 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 people being there right i mean there has never been a wedding where people weren't gathered and the purpose for the people gathering was to celebrate the couple being wed yeah. right and and so there it's not possible to be in a wedding without giving your your approval um at at, at least just by function and and so yeah, I would I would agree with you. I, I would say there's there's not going to be a time where you can participate in a wedding. Now, okay, so maybe I can think of an exception. If you want to go to the wedding and pass out Paul Washer salvation tracks to everyone, maybe that would <laughs> be maybe that'd be an exception. Well, I, but um, yeah, and and someone someone gave the example of um, well, what if you can go and actually have an opportunity to preach the gospel? Well. That that would be nice. Uh, you, you have an opportunity to preach the gospel, but in preaching the gospel, you better make clear that what's happening there is an abomination to God, and that it needs to be repented of. Uh, let me give you a, a an example. There was um there was a time, and and I still hold to this. I, I would not participate in a conference or seminars or share the stage with people who are false teachers. 
Okay, that's that's a general principle that I will uh, that that will hold for the rest of my life um, by by the grace of God. A couple of years ago, there was a baccalaureate service, the, the baccalaureate service for high school graduates who um, claim to be Christian. You know, there's going to be there's going to be a ceremony for them, and people go up there and and kind of give a speech to them as they go out into the world. And so I was invited to speak at this baccalaureate service. I went ahead and accepted. And it was at a, another church, not ours, but the church, a church a couple of miles away from um, from where we are. And I found out later that um, there were going to be people of all kinds of different religious walks there. There was going to be a rabbi. There was going to be a Catholic priest. Um, there was going to be uh, there, there was going to be all kind, of, even someone from uh, from Islam, um, a Muslim up there speaking. And so I'm like, whoa, wait a second. This is okay. Now now this changes and. Right around that time, uh, the pastor of the church where this was being held at, he calls me, and I found out that he originally was supposed to be speaking at this, but he got sick. That's why they asked me to step in, step into his place. But he also didn't know that there's going to be all these speakers from all kinds of different mm. faiths, if you will. And and he said to me, he said, uh, he said, brother, what what should I do? I don't want these false teachers on the stage of our church, you know, saying what they're going to say. And uh, and knowing that this ceremony was going to happen anyway, whether it's at this location or another, I told him, I said, let's do this. Um, keep the ceremony, but tell the organizers that I have to be the last one to speak. Okay, so I will be there, but make sure that you you see to it that of all the speakers that I'm the last, uh, that I've got the last word. And, and my rationale in that is that after they've listened to all the junk that they're going to listen to, I want to get up there and speak very clearly what the gospel is. Um, I, I want them to hear the gospel, and I want that to be the last thing that they heard. Now, some people listening to this going, well, I wouldn't have done it anyway. You you shouldn't have done that. Um, I stand by, by that decision, um, but it was a very unique kind of situation um, where— People from all kinds of different faiths are up there, and I don't think people are mistaking us as standing together. They might, but in giving the gospel, I think I make it very clear that there's no room for anything else except faith in Christ. So that was my conviction at the moment. And and so there are going to be times where we're going to make exceptions based upon what's available to us and what we think we might be able to do for the glory of God. John MacArthur was once asked, if there was any place you could be in the world to preach— where would it be? And and I think his answer was the Vatican, because he wants to preach the gospel to the Pope, right? So that that's a situation like what? Why do you want to go to the Vatican? Obviously, false religion, um, a false gospel. They they have long been a uh, kind of antichrist um, against uh, the truth. And but but John says he wants to be there because he wants to shed the truth in a place uh, of great darkness. So there are times where we might make exceptions because we think. We, we believe that the truth of God, we have an opportunity to share the truth of God, and we should share it clearly. And, and so it's the same thing in that kind of situation. If you think that you've got an opportunity um, to, to really help people come to know God in some way, shape, or form, I don't see how you're going to do it in that kind of situation, in this case, a wedding ceremony and, and a reception. Um, but if you feel that you have that opportunity, who am I to say that you can't do that? And, and that this is... Um, this is one of those things where if one of the, uh, if a church member came to me and asked me the same question, Pastor, should I go to this wedding? I would tell him, I would not, and here are the reasons. And I would explain everything that we're talking about right now. And, and But I, I would tell him, but I can't stop you from going, and I'm not going to church discipline you if you go. But if you go, make sure you go settled in your conscience that you can do something for the glory of God here. Um, and, and I would leave it at that. Now, I, I know other people would take a different tact. They they might resort to church discipline. They they might rebuke this person against that. But ultimately, everyone's going to make their own decisions based upon mm -hmm. their convictions from Scripture. My job is to make sure I expose Scripture to them and show them the reasons why I believe what I believe. Yeah, and and you know, my view would be slightly different. I, I would just say unequivocally, no, you you cannot go. Um, it, you well. You know, here's the thing. You cannot go and be one who sits in and observes the wedding and that not be um, by all appearance uh, tacit approval of what's going on. So, no, you shouldn't go. Um, and uh, but but I also wouldn't church discipline the person uh, as long as I knew that they were against, you know, yeah, they, they right. may be making a poor decision, you know, um, but my counsel would be, no, you can't go. 
you know, but I, I could think of other instances where maybe, I mean, I kind of joked about handing out Paul right. Washer tracks, but um, it, it, you know, if, if you're just going to pick a fight, I don't think you should do that either. Right. Just rather not go. So in any, in any case, Alistair Beggs, I, I think application was, w- was bad. Now I think what I would do differently, um, and, and you recognize that there's fam- familial relationship here. Um, and, and maybe my advice wouldn't be perfect either, but I think what I would have told the grandmother is look, um, you, you can't go to that wedding. And I know it's going to be hard for you because he's still your grandson. I know it's going to be hard for him because you're still his grandmother. What what you should do is you should go and talk to him one on one and use it as an opportunity to share the gospel with him again in telling him why you cannot be there and make sure that he knows you you love him as grandson, but your fealty to Christ and um, to truth is such that you, you, you cannot go to something like that and you don't go. Um, and, yeah. and I think that's what I would have, the direction I would have taken. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And, yeah, and, and I that totally way, understand that. Yep. and that way he knows why she's not there, whether he agrees or he's not. Right. I think she's taken the extra care, um, to, to even give him the gospel, but, but then also to say, look, you're still my grandchild and, and I do still love you, but, you know, I'm, I'm faithful to Christ. And so I, I can't participate in that and I can't be there. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, honestly, the, the, the adding on of buying the gift was just worse, uh, you know, because it, you know, again, really poor advice from an otherwise solid, uh, faithful man. Um, because I, I think the gift giving also just adds an extra layer of approval. Um, so better not go. So if, if you're faced with those things in the future, I think I think what Alistair, I hope, um, and based on the things, the the few things I've heard him say, I, I think what he's trying to get at, though he applied it wrongly, it is right. And and I think it's this. When you're when you're dealing with family and when you're dealing with these issues, you want to deal with these people in such a way that that they can accuse you of being ungodly. They might not use yeah. those terms, right? Um, they, they can accuse you of having a combative, sinful response. Um, and I'm using those terms in ways we would understand them, right? Yeah, um, right. So we're not supposed to be pugnacious. Let them not be able to accuse you of being pugnacious, Right, because yep, that's sinful. Exactly, and, and so you 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 can't do what Alistair recommended, um, but you can go to the person individually and say, "Look, I you know I love you. You're you're my daughter. You're my son. I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to care about you." Um, right. But but we are loyal to Christ, and so we can't su- we can't support your uh, view of this. We can't support your uh, choice. We can't even support you by our being present. Um, and, and, and you, you go about it that way. But I think, I think what Alistair is saying is make the effort, um, to, to be loving in the way you deal with these things. Um, I I don't, I don't think his way was loving. Um, you know, that application I think is in fact the opposite of it. Um, but I, I think that's where he was trying to go. Um, and who knows just based on my limited exposure, but that would be my argument too. As we deal with the world, um, we do need to deal with them in a righteous, God-fearing way. Um, and and if you don't know what that looks like, man, read more Charles Spurgeon. I get so sick and tired of hearing these manly men puffing out their chest, <laughs> yeah. talking about being a real man, fighting the world, while quoting Spurgeon, the very one who said, if sinners were going to go to hell, they should have to leap over our dead bodies uh, yeah. because we're pleading with them. And nobody yeah. would accuse Spurgeon of not being a real man. Um, right. and, and, and so, yeah, we stand up for truth. We say homosexuality is sinful. I, and, and just like you, it is a different kind of sin. And the Bible even distinguishes it. Right. Um, yes. When it says it's it's not just any kind of sin, it's not a sin outside the body. You sin against even your own body. It sins against God's created order. 
uh, and yeah, in some way right. in ways that other sins don't. So um, it is it is a different kind of thing, but we can make those statements without to people without responding in a way that Christ didn't respond. And I think there's wisdom. It, you know, when we study um, Christ's response, one, there's wisdom in knowing that Christ was perfect um, and responded perfectly because he was God and we are not. Um, right. Some of the things he said, he said specifically to fill, fulfill prophecy, which we will never do. Um, right. But there are times for words that there's a better term for harsh, but seem harsher. Um, but I think we need wisdom in when to use those, right? That shouldn't be like our go-to default is just that we're right. harsh uh, with everyone we deal to. Um, you know, some sometimes the absolute foolish fellow needs a hard word uh, to, to wake him yeah, up. But absolutely. I think it's wisdom um, when you use that and when you just leave him alone, you know, in his ignorance. So, um, Alistair was wrong, but I think, I, I think what he's trying to get at is, is really something we should need to think about, right? Yeah. If we care about whether or not these people are going to hell, and I have to be qu quite frank, I think a lot of these guys I see could really care less if people go to hell or not. Um, and that's just, that's just not Christian, right? I mean, we should care where these people's souls are going and so we can not participate in their deeds um, and call out their sin and do it in a way that we, we still desire their salvation, right? Absolutely. Yeah, let me share um, one experience I had. So uh, there's this couple, um, husband, wife, who was counseling them, and they have a couple of sons who are living the homosexual lifestyle. And that that had grieved this couple, uh, but there were other issues going on there as well between the husband and wife that I was trying to help them work through. And at some point, these two sons uh, came back into town and wanted to meet with me. <clears throat> now, knowing I already knew there were homosexuals, and so I, I wasn't sure exactly what they wanted to say to me, but they came in and initially wanted to talk about their parents and the difficulties there and how they should uh, navigate some of the difficulties going on at home and, and the things that are being said. And so uh, I'm talking to them and knowing in the back of my mind, the, these two are living a homosexual lifestyle. And, and then at some point, one of them decides to bring it up saying, pastor, did you know that um, both of us are homosexuals? And I said, yes, I've heard. And they said, well, what do you think about that? And at that point, I, I had to open up the scriptures. And I'm thinking at this point, you know what? They're probably going to hate me after this, but I've got to show them what the scriptures say. And so I opened up the scriptures and took them to 1 Corinthians 6, took them to Romans 1, showed them the passages that make it very clear that the choices that they're making are sinful. And uh, they said that they want to know the Bible better. Uh, I said, you should go to a Bible teaching church. I can send you some links. They didn't live locally. They lived out in Arizona. So I can send you some links to some good churches. And I would just I would just recommend you go and just listen to the preaching. Uh, listen to the preaching. You don't have to try to become members just yet. Just listen to the preaching. And my hope, obviously, in giving this advice is that they would come to know Christ. Um, but after all was said and done, I made it clear to them that their lifestyle was sinful, um, but that I wanted them to know the Lord. I wanted them to know the gospel. I shared the gospel with them. And after that, they left and they went back to their parents and they told their parents, and, and this is by the grace of God, I didn't do anything special or anything, but they told their parents that, that they were very fortunate to have a pastor who loves them as well as even these two sons who are homosexual they said that even though I disagree with their lifestyle, they felt like they were loved. And that's not always going to happen. In fact, I think that's going to be very much the exception. Most people are going to respond very bitterly by disagreeing with their lifestyle. But it is possible to share the truth and to share the truth in love. How they receive it is not in your control. How you deliver it is. But yeah. stand upon the truth because it is both possible and necessary that we share the truth and we share the truth in love. That's even a commandment um, out of the book of Ephesians. 
Yeah. And, and speaking of, of Ephesians, uh, l- let me just, I want to read this section, Ephesians chapter five, right? I mean, this gets brought up uh, and I think rightfully so you referenced it earlier, in fact. Um, you know, so this section here, just from five down to uh, 13, it says, for this, you know, with certainty that no one sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This would be one of those verses yeah. you would take them to, right? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. Um, For it is even disgraceful to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Oh, there's a verse we could learn from today, too. Uh, There's just this little section is jam packed with good application for whether or not you attend a wedding and and how you go about not attending. Right. Um, And and so, I, I mean, when you think about these things, I think, yeah, absolutely. Christians, we don't support homosexuality by participating in their ceremonies, right? I, I think that's clear. But when it's family, I, I think we have opportunity to go beyond just declining to participate. And I would argue you have responsibility to go beyond that. Well, for one, you're told to expose it. Well, I think wisdom would say exposing darkness um, to a family member would be to go in their... Um, when, when when they're in the state of most receptiveness, which is not going to be when they're around a bunch of their friends. So go to your family, no. your loved one privately and sit them down and say, you know, just kind of like what I said earlier, you know, I, I can't attend this this wedding, but I, I want you to know why. And you take them to the scripture and take them to the gospel because first you care about their soul not whether or not you're attending this wedding, right? Uh, That's the problem. They're having a gay ceremony because they are Christless, um, because they're in the grips of Satan. That's why they're doing it, and for no other reason. And so you take them to the scriptures, and you expose the darkness in them by showing them the light. And you're fulfilling this passage in all of its ways in that application. You're refusing to, to partake with darkness by not going to the ceremony. You're exposing the light um, by taking them to Scripture and showing them you know, that homosexuality is an abomination before God. You're doing it in love because predominantly you're doing all of this in a way that's caring for their soul, calling them to repent um, and come to Christ. And so I think you can do all of the things in this passage without— um, being this angry, combative right. jerk, pugilistic, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, you know, and and so, and that has to be our goal. But I'll tell you this: if if you don't have a love for people, generally, if you don't care about where they're going to spend eternity, then just don't even quote a Bible verse. Just, just you know, just say you're not going for whatever reasons you don't want to go. Um, Because that has to be the mentality of a Christian is that we care about the souls of people. Well, and I I would I would add to that. First, John says, if if you don't love your brother, then you're not walking in light. Yeah, yeah. You know, Christ came to call the sinner to repentance. I mean, think about Nineveh. I mean, this is maybe a great, you know, um, even Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. You know, God says, yeah, if you find, if you find 10, if you find even, five, yeah, even five, find, five, yep. Yeah. It, you, know, yep. you know, but Nineveh, I, I mean, is another good example. Um, yeah. Did God say he was going to destroy it? He, he did, but he offered repentance. Not, yeah. not only did God offer repentance, he made an angry prophet who didn't want to go, go. Yeah. Right. right? Right. Um, Mm -hmm. To offer and 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 his response is fantastic because I think it demonstrates something of the character of God we ought to display when we're dealing with the wicked. I mean, Nineveh was a wicked 
a, a, a wicked yeah, and absolutely. perverse kingdom. Um, yeah. And and what we have now is too. And uh, you know, he didn't want to go because he says, "Well, God, I knew you'd be gracious." Yeah, right? I knew you were going to save them. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that has to yeah. be our attitude. We expose yeah. the sin. Um, we take them to the gospel. We know that, and and we call them to repent. And I think we don't shrink yeah. back with the language of hell, right? I'm not talking about um, this kind of touchy feely. Everyone's going to be okay uh, if yeah. you love Jesus. It'll be kumbaya. No, it's your soul is in imminent peril. You yeah. know, you're going to spend eternity in hell um, if you don't bow the knee to Christ. Um, but th but that can be done in a way that cares for the person rather than sometimes it just seems like we hate people. You know, yeah, if you just right. read some of the comments. Um, so I, I think not only do we have to be careful with how we respond to men like Alistair Begg and even more, yeah, I, I think it's even more sinful to be honest, to respond to a brother or sister in the faith, the way some yeah. have responded to Alistair. Um, and, and when we think about the world, it, it's not that we're, we are fighting evil, but we're not fighting the people, you know, and we might have right. to fight against the things they're doing. So yeah, let's make legislation. Let's stop uh, the murder of children. Let's stop pedophiles and transing kids and do all those things we can do. Um, but but we're, you weren't in a spiritual battle, right? Ephesians six. And so yeah. if you win, you win that spiritual battle by exposing darkness primarily by the gospel, right? Amen. So any last words on Alistair Big or homosexual so-called weddings? Um, no, I, I, I think we covered we'll it. Um, we, we need to know what the biblical principles are. We need to be very clear on how we stand upon those biblical principles. But we also have to make sure that everything that we do, we do in love. That's what Paul said when he said, act like men, and yet let everything you do be done in love. Um, give grace to to others, and especially those who have done well in terms of their work in the kingdom. Uh, we can disagree with one another without turning the other person into our enemy. Yeah, amen. You know, there's there's the command in Scripture Paul gives to Timothy um, about elders, those who are worthy of double honor. Yeah. And um, I, I think, just based on what little I know, that Alistair Begg still fits in that category as one who has yep. been worthy of double honor. And so I think we have to tread carefully even when we disagree. He's wrong, you know, and I think I could just say that plainly and emphatically. Um, yeah. But we still need to honor him, at least to this point, as someone who has been faithful to the gospel and faithful uh, to the cause of Christ. And uh, Lord willing, you know, he'll come out and, you know, make some kind of statement since he made that publicly. But he's still a faithful man of God um, until he proves otherwise, right? Yeah. And let me just add real quick, it's not wrong to be concerned about this. I think this kind yeah, of absolutely. counsel should concern us. And it's not even wrong to say, well, I'm not going to recommend him anymore. I, I get that. I understand that position at all. I will say it's wrong to 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 slander him the way he's been slandered and to throw him under the bus as if all his previous ministry meant nothing. Yeah, yeah. The, this is the kind of advice that is that that we approach cautiously and and now we watch, right? Yeah. But right. we watch as though we're watching someone who's been faithful. Right. So. Right. Well, guys, I hope this has been helpful uh, to you. We're going to have a lot of more of these kinds of issues um, as as society declines. And I, I think our plea to you uh, is just to think through these things carefully, prayerfully, um, and thoughtfully considering the faithfulness of the men who, you know, sometimes just make really bad, um, you know, really, they give really bad advice at times. We're all fallen and we all need some yeah. grace um, and then prudence would just say, let, let's just keep an eye out and see what develops in the future. So yep. don't forget, we have a YouTube channel. Love for you to uh, subscribe to that. Uh, if you have any um, suggestions for podcast topics, we'd love for you to shoot us an email. You can find those in the show notes. And until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ 
by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.